Welcome back. This is the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always, my co-host, Nick Bellato. Today, we're here to do another edition of the Mailbag, Mailbag Part 2. A lot of questions. Want to get to as many as we can. Uh, we're going to try to get to them all. We'll see what we can do. So let's dive right in. Waste no more time, Nick. Perito pens and asks, what are your playoff predictions? Who do you think makes it to the conference championships and the Super Bowl? Okay, so playoff predictions, I think, for conference championship might end up being it would be cool if it's the NFC East. It would be cool if it's the Giants. I don't think I'd pick it that way. I think it might be the 49ers and the Eagles getting there. And for the AFC, I don't even know what the what the bracket looks like right now in the AFC. Do you, Dan? No, it's a mess right now. It's an absolute mess. So it's kind of hard to predict. But if I I guess I had to predict, I think the Bengals, the Chiefs, or the Bills will probably be two of the teams that are involved in the AFC championship. It's a little bit more difficult. In terms of the Super Bowl Let's rock with the uh, let's rock with the Chiefs and the Eagles and the Chiefs win. Damn, we have pretty close predictions. I do think that the Giants are going to beat the Vikings. I have a very yeah. good feeling about it. But I also think that the Niners will beat the Packers, and so it'll be a Giants Eagles sec- divisional and a Packers Cowboys divisional. I mean, I'm sorry, a Niners Cowboys or Eagles Giants Niners Cowboys. I think the Niners will beat the Cowboys. They just match up really well against them. That's the only reason I think they'll win. I don't know if they're the better team, but I think they'll match up well. And I think the Eagles will beat the Giants, and I think the Eagles will beat the Niners. So I have the Eagles advancing there. Other side, it's basically just which of those three teams, I completely agree with you, those are the teams to beat. Which of those teams are not playing each other in the divisional round? So I don't know the bracket because it's all screwed up because of the game that got suspended, and I don't know what they're still going to do about that. I just read something like an hour ago that says they might consider doing an 18 playoff with no bye week, which is wild. Um, yeah. They're just still, you know, throwing things at the wall and they're going to they just do like winning percentage. That seems to, wasn't that what yeah. they were going to do back in 2020? I don't know, but I'm going to say chiefs advance out of all those teams though. So I'm going with the chiefs versus the Eagles and the chiefs to win the super bowl. Wow. The same exact cheese. Yeah. Look at Did us. You pick Chiefs or Eagles, though. Did you pick the winner? Yeah, I said I said Chiefs okay. would win. So yeah, it's the same thing. Damn. All right. All, th- all things giant ass. We're aware of Nick's aversion to carves. That said, if there was no caloric consequences, what would you each eat and drink if calories slash cost weren't an issue? You go first, Nick. Me go first. Okay, I would I'm go for dessert. I, I, I like I like desserts. I like sweets, but. If I'm going to go for more of a meal, I think I would just go for some pizza. Now, I may eat an entire pizza pie, which is something I don't think I have ever done. Maybe I did it a little bit when I was like, you know, a kid or something like that. <laughs> I'd probably go for pizza, a nice Italian meal. Like, I haven't had pasta in so long, Dan. Damn. Like, an actual pasta dish. So, I might actually go for that too. Like, how long do you think it's been since you had pasta? A long time. Yeah. <laughs> what I, what I is a like, long time? Like, like the last time I sat down for a dinner and was like, I'm going to get chicken Alfredo or I'm going to get yeah. this. Or like my mother made me like something pasta related. And that's the only thing I ate years, bro. Like I, yeah. I it's, it's probably been a couple years. Yeah. Wow. Now there are times where like, you know, my girl might have a little pasta and I like, you know, nip, get a little bit of it like that. But like, I've never actually sat down and ordered that, but yeah, I would probably go with pizza and then I would just pig out on some desserts. That's a great question. Uh, I don't, the good news for me, all things giants is I don't really consider calories or cost when I'm eating food. Uh, I guess I'm in an okay financial position, but I mean, I'm not eating like crazy meals anyway. And as far as the calories go, this is why I have a gut because I don't consider these types of things. If I didn't, if I did, maybe I won't have a gut. Um, it's very hard to, for me to care though, because uh, I don't know, man, I just like to enjoy myself when it comes to food. I don't really try to worry too much about uh, how it's going to affect how I look or how I feel, unfortunately, because you know, Sometimes you do eat like crap and you feel it. That's the other thing. It's not just about the calories. Sometimes you feel like crap. But regardless, it would be pizza for me. New York, New Jersey style, tri-state area style pizza or Connecticut style, New Haven style. I could eat a pie. Like if if there was nothing to it, I could just keep pounding pizza. Like sometimes I go to poker games and they have a lot of food and they have a spread and they have like pizza. And I'll just like notice like I'm bored and I eat like four slices in a night. And I'm like, what the hell is wrong with me? I do it anyway. Uh, It's so good every time. So I'll go pizza. Um, as far as drink goes, I, mm-hmm. one of my key things, it wouldn't be alcohol. I, it'd probably be like, if calories didn't matter, it honestly would probably be soda. And I sucks to, cause I don't, I eliminated soda from my diet like six to eight years ago, maybe around that time. I'll still have one occasionally, like very occasionally, but, and, and I have a ton of seltzer, which is like basically fills that void for me. 
But soda, man, I used to love soda. In my household, we grew up with soda and candy. Our parents did not do the best job as far as like, uh, you know, keeping us healthy go. But we were burning off calories at a fast rate, I guess. But we had a ton of soda in the house, and I used to drink a ton of soda. So it would definitely be soda for me. I miss I'm not a big though. I'm not a big soda guy. I honestly yeah. glossed over the drink part because I don't, I just don't like even think about drinks that have calories because to me, they're just useless unless it's alcohol. Yes. And I, I mean, I'll, I, I'll enjoy like a nice glass of whiskey every now and again and be like fine with it. But like, I don't drink too often or too frequently. Right. So, uh, yeah, it would probably just be some sort of like Manhattan or something. But which... I think like you say that, but I'm not so, I feel like you haven't had a lot of soda in your life and that's probably part of the reason because you love seltzer and it's just seltzer with sugar in it. How could that, you would like that. Like there's no way you could tell me you wouldn't like that. Dude, I have trained myself, I think, and this is not healthy whatsoever. <laughs> to look like at, to, yeah, no, I've manipulated myself to where I like view, I like look at soda and I'm like, that's not appealing to me at all. Like I view wow. it more as like an alcoholic mixture mixer like I, okay. I just don't find it appealing like i i think like when you drink it and it touches your teeth and like you scratch your teeth together it makes a weird sound like i'm just i'm just not about soda as an individual it's actually drink. a good move to do with unhealthy things like trick your mind into just like being disgusted by them and then you won't consume them um that's how i feel with cigarettes man like i never in my life got into cigarettes i'm so happy that i Neither have i just i find the taste of them disgusting and that's so good for me because i would have definitely got addicted to cigarettes at some point given my other habits as far as those things go and i would have definitely at some point like been in a cigarette kick or something like that or a jewel kick but i just the jewels are tougher because those actually like those uh electronic ones they taste yeah. like their flavors so those actually taste good but i just try to never get into that because i know i might like that but cigarettes always had the most disgusting taste to me like when i used to smoke them in college like when i was drinking or whatever and like yeah they gave you a nice little head rush for a little while because i don't not used to nicotine but the taste out was <laughs> It's just like disgusting to me. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I did that psychologically with cigarettes. What you just described for soda. So I've never had nicotine before. Wow. I never, I never you did never dip. a drag of a cigarette. Wow. Nope. Yeah, never. Good a lot of people always told me like, oh yeah, you know, you're joining the Marines. Of course you're going to get it. I'm like, oh. I don't think so. And I never felt the peer pressure or never, never felt obligated or it yeah. was necessary or anything like that. Did anyone in your family ever smoke cigarettes? Yeah. Both my parents okay. did growing up, but uh, they both quit. Okay. Yeah. So maybe it was partially that you saw growing up and you didn't, you didn't want to do it. Um, all right. Johnny Rudin asks, you have to, let's play a game of keep trade cut. Here are your guys. Saquon Barkley, Daniel Jones, Andrew Thomas. Damn dude. Okay. So honestly, this one, this one sucks. Johnny Rudin. So, uh, let's go with, uh, yeah, you're making us trade and cut two of the three. Like that is a hard question for us to do. Like we have to literally get rid of two of these players in the question. So the way we have to look at it is who is the most valuable trade piece, right? So who can you get the most value for? And I think ultimately I'm going to keep Andrew Thomas. So who can I get more value for? A quarterback, 25-year-old quarterback in Daniel Jones or Saquon Barkley. And I think you can get more value for Daniel Jones. So I'm going to trade Daniel Jones and I'm going to cut Saquon Barkley and I'm going to keep Andrew Thomas. Same answer. Keep Thomas. Trade Jones, cut Barkley. I think before the season, a case could probably be made that Barkley had more trade value. I was hearing before the season, like Jones was only going to get like a compensatory late round pick, but I think he's totally revived his value this year. And so now I think he would get a lot more. Remember, Carson Wentz was traded just recently, first to the Colts for a haul, and then again this past offseason, which was insane. And I know he had an MVP season under his belt, which Jones doesn't have, but I think you can make the case that Jones's 2022 season is at least somewhat comparable to that MVP season when you factor in um, the supporting cast, which was better for the Eagles that year than it was for Jones this year. So I think that Jones would get the biggest haul. So either way here, I'm trading and cutting Barkley and Jones. So it's not like I'm trying to, you know, the decision is where do you get more value and it's from Jones. I agree. Yeah, I think that's where you would get more value. Let's move on to Simon Goldbird Birds asks, how durable is the recent reliance on quick game by the Giants? How can playoff defenses adjust to the quick game? And would the Giants have an answer? That's a great question. Um, I feel like it's a little bit more reliable. So just one thing with quick game. All quick games are different, right? The Giants ran quick game a lot with Jason Garrett, but it looks so completely different than some of the quick game stuff. They're, most all of the quick game they're running with Kafka and Dable. Why? Because there's different route combinations. There's different ideas and concepts to free up open receivers. And so I think ultimately Kafka is going to have a great answer for all the defenses he faces throughout the playoffs when it comes to 
creating different concepts and quick game to get players open. But I think as far as defenses go, you will start to see some adjustments. We even started to see it last week against the Colts with like corner in the cover too, faking like he's dropping and then rotating right down on the quick out to Hodgins and he drives and he hits him. And then the, the vert was open because that corner was driving down, but the defense knows Jones is not going to, the offense isn't looking for the vertical. They're looking to get the quick solution. And so you'll start to see a lot of that, like the corners baiting the, the quick game. And that could lead to interceptions. Let's be honest. It could lead to big hits on the receivers, fumbles, things of that nature. But I think that Nick will probably have a good response for how maybe then Giants can adjust to that adjustment. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of reliance on Daniel Jones to protect the football. And that shouldn't be anybody's surprise. But we know a lot of these quick game concepts. And I feel like the Giants are doing a good job making some of these concepts look the same. Like, like say the, the main one right. that they've been using is like the deep corner with Darius Slayton off the stack. And then Daniel Bellinger just running a quick spot, feeling the coverage sitting between the void right now. Another thing that they run at that same exact look is a drive series. They run the deep dig and then they mm -hmm. run the drag route, totally different type of concept. If you're going to try to anticipate the spot, you more than likely might be out of position when Daniel Bellinger doesn't stop and he ends up running a drag route, right? So you have to kind of um, feel that out if you're Daniel Jones, not put the football into a position where somebody is baiting you to throw that spot route that right. is anticipated by the defense. But another way to do it, if your cornerback is squatting, you can go deep, right? Like Daniel Jones has the arm to throw deep. He has the arm to challenge defense vertically. We haven't seen it all that much this season, but he's fully capable of doing so. So if you want to cut, you want to play cover two and cut, <clears throat> attack the honey hole, right? They have a safety over top near the hash or just, uh, just inside of the hash or what have you attack the honey hole, take that shot. Something we haven't seen Daniel Jones do too often, but you can't. So yeah, it's a quick mm -hmm. game concept, but if the defense is showing you, Hey, we're playing your quick game, be like, Roger that we're going to attack you vertically now. And right. now we got 15 yards or even if it's an incomplete pass, what does it do? It puts that into the defense's mind. Hey man, we can't really squat too often True. if they're going to keep challenging us vertically. That's a great point. And I think part of why the Giants can have a, or I guess I wouldn't say counter, but the Giants have a little bit of more leeway to go using quick game. So even like things like, you know, slant flat concept, right? That they run a ton or the curl flat concept. Well, one thing it helps to have is a quarterback like Daniel Jones, who's not only nearly six foot five, but also has been taught by Cutcliffe that over the top delivery. So now one of the biggest issues with quick game for some of these quarterbacks that are smaller than Jones and don't throw over the top every time is getting balls bad down the line of scrimmage. Cause that's something I was about to say, we're going to look for, you know, how do defenses adjust? Well, they teach their, you know, they tell their defensive linemen, don't just rush up the field, you know, try to get your hands up in the passing lane if they're running quick game. But with Jones, that actually helps uh, not doesn't help, but I mean, it's a good Jones is a great counter to that type of con that type of thing because he's tall and he throws over the top. And he also, if he doesn't like what or love what he sees, he uses runs right. Correct. That and a lot of these concepts too are three man route concepts to one side of the field. A lot of them being on the boundary. So a lot of these times the giants are just using the running back as a flare and mm -hmm. that's going to force the linebacker typically, unless they push or do some sort of coverage switch to work through traffic. So that Barkley or that Breida is going to have a little bit of leverage. And there are times where Daniel Jones looks, doesn't love what he sees, just dumps it right to Saquon Barkley. Right. Just like, All right, let's just get two, three, four yards. Maybe we'll get something a little bit bigger. And I feel like Jones specifically has done a very good job diagnosing that, not putting the football into harm's way in those quick passing concepts because he has that outlet devised for him by Kafka and Dable. Yeah, that's a great take. Okay, Takuma Rowe says, if the Shane Dable regime follows the blueprint of the Bills, then what talented emerging wide receivers do you see them targeting via trade? We've answered this one in the first podcast, but we mentioned some names. Uh, Brandon Ayuk is somebody who I am most excited for and would be most interested in. T. Higgins, close. I just really think Ayuk has legit. I think Ayuk has wide receiver one potential. I think he has the speed. I think he has the elusiveness. I think he has the body control. And I think he has the the um, contested catch ability. That's not hasn't all been shown. And obviously the breakaway speed, you can tell. But that would be my guy. Higgins is another possibility. Anyone else come to mind for you, Nick? And those are the two main ones. I mean, DJ yeah. Moore's name has been floated out there. He already has that contract. Right. Like, look, I'll always like entertain a skill set like that, but I'm more so interested in in Higgins and IU because yeah. of their sheer size. And I, I really think that's what the Giants need right now. Not that DJ Moore is a small guy. DJ Moore is like fine from a size standpoint. But I look at an IU and I look at a T Higgins and I'm like, one on one situations, you could put that football up there and 50 50 balls. They can win them, dude, because they're wildly talented. Now, more can, but it's a, a different type of a method, I feel like. He's just a different type of receiver than those. I other would agree teams. with that. Okay, David Goodman asks, we are all thrilled with how much Daniel Jones has improved under Kafka and Dable. Or Kafka and Dable. 
but I still have doubts that he that you can win a Super Bowl with him. What's your opinion on this? Hey, I think any quarterback, not any, but like I think quarterbacks on good teams with a lot of good pieces around them, they can win Super Bowls because they have good pieces around them yeah. and they can just do enough to not lose you the game. And I'm not necessarily saying Daniel Jones is that, but do I think Daniel Jones in the right environment with the right pieces around him, with the ball bouncing in his direction, could he win a Super Bowl? I don't think it's unreasonable to say yes, but also I think these questions, they're, they're sort of, they're sort of um, a lot of conjecture in them and, and they're sort of circumstantial because we don't really know what exactly is going to happen in the divisional round or the AFC championship. Can Daniel Jones lead game winning drives and get you into a position to win? Yes. He's proven that this season, right? right. Before the year, we didn't know that this season. He has proven that sure. in high leverage situations. Is he Pat Mahomes? Is he Josh Allen? No, he's not. But can he, I don't want to say get lucky because that's not the right way to phrase it, but can he put his team into a position to win? Yes. Can he do it in the Super Bowl? Look, we haven't seen it, so it's easy to say no, but I'm not going to fully rule it out. I think that's the way I would answer that. Yeah, I think Daniel Jones definitely can. If you're asking me my opinion, I do think Daniel Jones can win the Super Bowl if he's playing at this level right now or better, and he can be potentially a better quarterback working more within the system and with this coaching staff that clearly he meshes well with. Now, does that mean I think there's a difference between winning a Super Bowl and consistently getting your team in Super Bowl contention? That's yeah. the big difference here. I'm not sold yet that he can consistently get his team in Super Bowl contention every year. The players who can do that right now are Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow. That's pretty much the end of the list right now. Um, as far as and Jalen Hurts might creep into that, but I'm not ready to put him there just yet. And I'm not going to put Dak there. And I'm not going to put Jimmy G there. Whoever's going on now, Brock Purdy, whatever they've got going on there. Like to me, it's those three quarterbacks right now are the ones. And there's other people like that I'm intrigued by. Daniel Jones, you can throw into the mix if you want to. Justin Herbert, plenty of guys. But right now, it's those three. Every single year, right now. The Chiefs, the Bengals, the Bills are going to be in contention to win a Super Bowl. And that's that next level. And so far right now, he could still get better, Daniel Jones. That's the whole thing. Like, I do kind of now feel like I've changed my mind a little bit that it is kind of like year one for him. I kind of have gone back and forth on this because he's learning so many different new things with Dable and Kafka. And because the more time he has with them, I think he can become a better player. But as of right now, no, I don't think he's going to be the quarterback that you consistently are like the Super Bowl favorites with every year. Yeah, I think that's fair as well. And I'm right there with you. It's all about the consistency. Anybody can go on like a Rex Grossman type of run, but can you consistently get your team there? It's not a lot of quarterbacks that are doing that. Like I would have put Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady's name into that. Right. And I know Tom Brady's in the playoffs right now, but it's with the NFC South, which is as yeah. atrocious as the 2020 NFC East. Right. Joe Money asks, where would you rank Jones QB wise among the league? That's a good question, Dan. So I think we should pull up probably some sort of list of the quarterbacks, but he is much higher than I would say I, I would have him in the beginning of the year, right? Like is he top much higher than the beginning of the year? Top I don't right now. I don't really. I think he. I think he. Like okay, to answer the question, like Joe, I think he could be top fifteen right now for sure. By the way, I think he's playing like a top ten, top twelve this year, and I think part of that is the coaching, but that's still the end result is what we're getting. Yes. But I don't really want to answer this question, Joe, because. I just feel and I used to do QB rankings and I had fun with them and I did my like tiered rankings thing. I would put it on Twitter every year at the beginning of a season, just kind of feel I feel with these quarterbacks. But now that we do this, what we do for the podcast, Nick, and this is also addressed to you, Joe, and anyone listening, like now that Nick and I do spend the time week after week to pour hours into the film study and like you guys may see it on our YouTube, it's two hours long, but we're also studying on our own and watching the film for five, six hours. It's Nick's watching the film for like 20 hours, watching back and forth, back and forth every day, even Thursday and Friday, he's rewatching film. So now that I see that on one quarterback and whoever the Giants face that week, I just don't love to rank quarterbacks when I'm not watching Joe Burrow every week, when I'm not watching Patrick Mahomes every week on tape, when I'm not like, it's just so hard to do the rankings when you see one guy, you're watching the tape on Daniel Jones and then whoever he faces every week. And then otherwise you're not watching tape. You get one game of Geno a year, two games, of Jalen Hurts, two games of Dak. Like we have no games of Mahomes to watch this year. No games of Burrow. Right. And I watched some for my CBS podcast. I've seen a lot of Lawrence tape this year for example. And I've seen some golf tape recently. Adam wanted me to do something on golf last week to see how he's doing. And I, and he is playing pretty damn well within that system right now, but ben Johnson. that's my answer. I, I think it's the Ben Johnson element yeah. for Jared golf. That's what I, Brian, that was the case I made. Right. Exactly. It's the Brian Dable, Mike Kafka situation for Daniel Jones. And that's not a slight on a quarterback. Like, right. The coaching should not be viewed as like when you say, well, yeah, he has a good coach. That shouldn't be taken as a slight. Like coach's right. job is to get the most out of his quarterback. Okay, Rohan, we already did 
answer uh, your first question with somebody else's. So I'll go to your second question, which was a quote unquote, according to you, weird question. He says, I've never been to Giant Stadium. Any advice on someone who's attending their first game from North Jersey? Approximately how much would the not worst tickets be considering the recent playoff team? Um, assuming I go to a game in the 2023 or 2020 or in the next season, 2023, 2024. This is a question for you, Dan, because I haven't really been to a lot of giant games in my life. Yeah. So, Ron, if you're a fan of this podcast, one thing I would definitely suggest to you is you'd probably be a fan of what I am a fan of. And I know I've discussed this with Justin Panic of uh, Talking Giants. We like the third tier. Now, everybody's like, oh, my God, you like the third tier, the nosebleeds. Well, guess what you get when you go into the third tier? You get the all 22 angle all game. I would take the third tier 50 yard line, Nick, over the first tier th third row thousand out of a thousand times personally first of all one thing i'll say the second thing rohan make sure if you want to watch this football game make sure you do not buy end zone seats i'm not trying to take a shot at anyone who has end zone season tickets god bless some people like that view but i hate the end zone angle you can never tell the yardage when it's on the other side of the field you have to watch you find yourself watching the screen because it's so far away so try to get sideline angle and try to get close to the 50 as you can and go up to the third tier i suggest it the prices will be cheaper in the third tier and you're going to get the all 22 angle. Now, I will say this about the new giant stadium, which sucks in the third tier. There used to not be a bad seat, in my opinion, from an all 22 angle for in the old stadium. In this new stadium, MetLife, there are bad seats. Honestly, if you get into like row 17 or 18 and up, it's so insanely far away nowadays. And then if you go down in that third tier to like row three, four, five, um, which, by the way, uh, you know, I've done before. Just go out of your own seats and take a better seat. Why not? Um, no one's watching you'll see a huge difference. So try to get like anywhere between row one and 10 in the third tier and closer and sideline angle as close to the 50 as you can get. Johnny Ryden asks, do we snag Xavier Rhodes? Surely makes sense. Look, Xavier Rhodes played in what, two games for Buffalo this year, yeah. I believe. And I don't know how well it went. And he's like 33 years old, if I'm not mistaken, or, or something around that. So I'm not really looking to, to add him right now. And if the Giants add him, they're just going to put him on the practice squad until he yeah. is up to speed. Nick nailed it. I don't think he has the speed foot speed anymore to do it. Um, Ian Wenick asks sliding door moment for giants history. You could change one moment in giants history. Would you change moment a taking Tucker Fredrickson over Joe Namath in the 1965 draft changing moment B in the 1993 week 18 loss to Dallas. It cost the giants home field advantage in Lawrence Taylor and, and Phil Sims final season. C plaques go Burris shooting himself during the 2008 season. Or D, not trading up for Patrick Mahomes. So this is easy for me personally, and it's not trading up for Patrick Mahomes because if the Giants had Patrick Mahomes right now, we have a whole future of Patrick Mahomes ahead of us. And not to crap on anybody who was around for the 1965 draft, I wasn't, okay? It would be cool to be like, oh yeah, Joe Namath, but I wasn't even a twinkle in my father's eye at that point. So it's a little bit irrelevant to me when you're when relative to the rest of these options. To me, C is a close one because that Plexico gun incident might have robbed the Giants. Of a of a Super Bowl possibly, but I wasn't around in 2008 either because I was <laughs> I was away for that season, so I would have missed that just like I missed the 2011 one. So I'm gonna go with um, not trading up for Patrick Mahomes is my easy answer. Yeah, Ian, this is definitely a better question for non millennials, but unfortunately, you asked this question to two millennials, so we are aged out a bit from A. I mean, it just, look, A and B. I was like four years old in 1993, so I'm just not going to even consider those options because I want to be alive and experiencing these fun changes in history, these alternate realities, the the multiple timelines for the Giants. So it's between C and D. And I will say this about the 2008 season: that was by far and away the best Giants team I've ever watched, and it's not even close. Not only was it the best team I've ever watched, I feel very confident if Plaxo Burris didn't have that, uh, you know, didn't you know, kept the safety on his gun. Basically, that's all that needed to happen. The Giants would have won that Super Bowl, or at least they, I shouldn't say that. It's so hard to win Super Bowls. They would have made it to the Super Bowl. I really do feel that way. They lost a windy ass game that I was at to the Eagles as the one seed, and they just couldn't get anything going because Plax wasn't on the field. If he was on the field, you think back to the 2007 game against the Packers, a uh, championship game against Al Harris, they were just throwing like slants to him, and they were just throwing like easy combinations. He was dominating a one on one matchup. They didn't have anyone who could dominate a one on one matchup, and that lost to the Eagles in the divisional round. So even with that said, it's an easy D for me. I would love to have Patrick Mahomes. One, you know, obviously I'm a bit biased in this, but 
we're doing a podcast now on the Giants. I wasn't doing a podcast on the Giants in 2008. I would love to have a podcast that breaks down film on Patrick Mahomes every week. I'm sorry to say, no, no, this doesn't offend anyone who's in love with Dan Daniel Jones, but Daniel Jones is not Patrick Mahomes on tape. It's not even close. Um, and no one is really. I mean, Burrow comes close in some ways. Josh Allen comes close in other ways, but no one to me is close to Patrick Mahomes on tape, including those two guys. So to have Patrick Mahomes this year, last year, the year before, and probably for the next 10 years of Giants football, that would be the easy one for me. And they, they could have happened if Ben McAdoo got his way. I would also add the caveat that the Giants would somehow hire Andy Reid, though. Like they would have to Ooh. get Andy Reid because I don't know if Patrick Mahomes becomes Patrick Mahomes without the structure around him like Andy Reid. Now, maybe Ben McAdoo might have been able to do it and just talent would have ended up shining. But that is one caveat I think we should add to it because just different circumstances, the butterfly effect could have led to a totally different outcome for the young man. It could have. I don't love that. Ar I, not that I'm knocking you, you for that argument, but I, in general, I'm not a hugest fan of that argument just because I think what you said is, is mostly true. The talent outshines it. Like I look at uh, Joe Burrow, right? Last year with the Bengals or his first year, even before that, before the ACL injury, like they had one of the worst rosters I've ever seen in the NFL. And he looked I awesome right from the start. I feel like that's different, though, because Joe Burrow yeah. had the highest success at the collegiate level, whereas right. Patrick Mahomes was True. a real project coming in. Now, Ben McAdoo, because he loved him so much, maybe he would have allowed him to get away with all the unconventional things that right. he does very well. But if you put him with a coach that is austere and is like, no, you throw the football like this, you can't do this, True. that's off structure, then that might have stifled his development. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay. I like that take. Okay. Tej Holes says... If the Giants were to address the wide receiver position through the trade or free agency, and you can only have one of these three options, what would you like? Option one, you sign Odell Beckham for an AAV of between 15 and 18 million on a three-year deal. Option two, you trade draft picks for DJ Moore. Option three, you trade draft picks for Michael Pittman. Assuming in both trades and option uh, B and C, or two and three, they would include a first round pick and a day two pick. Yeah, man, this is a little difficult. I'm not really 100% certain. Do you do you have one that you are leaning towards, Dan? I'm leaning toward option one. Um, okay. You know how I feel, man. I don't like giving up draft picks. It's going to be Neither this way for as long as we do this podcast. For those of you listening in, I'm not going to love any of the trades, to be honest. Like, maybe if it's for Ayuk, I'll be, I'll be cool with it because I just think he's a, a young star. Moore's a little older. Pittman is not somebody who I love nearly as much. Um, I think Pitt, for me, it might go OBJ Pittman more. It would go and OBJ the, Pittman more for me. The OBJ Pittman one is probably, I think, a lot closer for me than maybe for you. I, I think adding Pittman, if he like, he seems like a smart guy. I, I can't really speak on it, but if he could adopt this offense, I feel like he's the type of guy that maybe the Giants are looking for. If he mm -hmm. does have the uh, football IQ that they're looking for in the wide receiver position, so I wouldn't be opposed to it. But for me, I, the multiple picks is is where I get a little eh. like if you're talking about like a a two and a five maybe, but like, I don't want to give a, a two and a three. And I think it probably would cost that to get a guy like that. And I don't want to give yeah. up a one for any wide receiver. That's not like a top flight dude. Yeah. So it, I don't really love any option, but I, OBJ is probably my one. Yeah. We're just not going to be a podcast here that loves trading draft picks, especially premium trade draft picks. We just view them insanely highly or it's as insanely valuable pieces, Nick and I. Well, well that, and it depends on the, on the situation, right? If the giants had a more complete roster, I would yeah. be much more, uh, prone to liking it but right now the yeah. Giants don't have a complete roster so these draft picks mean a lot and we've seen what Joe Shane and Brian Dable have done with their draft picks I mean this was an right. excellent draft class it got ravaged by injuries but a lot of these kids True. who were picked on day three seem to be hitting yeah Robinson right now would have been so good with the Giants right now if he was healthy oh, yeah. playing that Richie James role it sucks okay um this is more of a question I think for me so I'll answer it first Giant Roddy Piper says, how's your process on evaluating quarterbacks changed in the last 12 months? I remember you were high on Zach Wilson and sounded low on Jones. I know both those careers go either way, but interested if it's altered any thinking process. It has altered mine a, a little, so I'm curious. So, yeah, as I, I've been, you know, I've gone many different directions on quarterbacks, but one thing that I always look for is arm talent, and that's what swayed me on Zach Wilson. But one thing I didn't consider enough, there are a few things I didn't consider enough with Zach Wilson. The first one is, that a lot of the tape I watch of him at BYU, he was just sitting behind these insanely good pockets. And why was that? BYU had like the once in a generation combination on the offensive line. They had multiple guys who were drafted to the NFL there. And in addition to that, the matchups they had in that conference were against really small and bad defensive lines. So then when Zach Wilson got to the NFL, 
he was dealing with a whole different situ situation from a pressure standpoint. And then teams found out fast the easiest way to beat Zach Wilson is just by pressuring him. And that's not something he ever dealt with at BYU. So I didn't factor that in highly enough, and I should have. But the other thing that I didn't factor in, but it's impossible for me to ever factor in, which is always the missing and incomplete part of this whole process, is who the person is. Like Zach Wilson is the same thing that happened with Josh Rosen. These guys aren't wired to be like the best of the best. And no matter what, arm talent it, to me is insanely important. There are a lot of important things. The ability to throw off platform, the ability to create off script, the ability to process defenses to me is the number one thing. But all of none of those things matter unless you have the baseline. The baseline you have to have is you have to be dedicated, as hardworking as you can get, and want to be the best of the best. You have to have that Michael Jordan it factor of I'm going to be the best at this job, whatever it may be, quarterback, running back, receiver. And if you don't have that, there's nowhere to go. And I think, you know, I didn't give enough thought. And, and this wasn't the case with Wilson, but with Rosen, there were some, you know, discussions of does he love football? Does he really want to be this like amazing quarterback? And it turns out in my mind, he didn't want to be because I didn't. It's very hard to figure out how he was as big of a bust as he was when you watched him at UCLA. So I wasn't the only one high on him. Like you look across the the, the landscape. Uh, what's his name from? from Roto World, who's now been, now he's with NF NBC Sports, and he's with uh, Underdog, um, Josh Norris, the NFL draft analyst. He's a really good analyst. He had Rosen as like the number one overall prospect in his class, and I understood why. Like, he saw the field really well in college. He manipulated the middle of the field. All He did all these things that looked like very Tom Brady-esque at the collegiate level. Um, to, but, go, to go back to something we yeah. were talking about a little bit earlier, sorry to cut you off, yeah, his environment was crap, man. I mean, he went to the Arizona Cardinals, yeah. And he was with Steve Wilkes, who unfortunately but I just got think he's not it. No, I think that's no, the I agree with yeah. I agree with you, but like you're still your environment needs to be factored right. in. Like you could fizzle out. If you might not be it, but if you're giving a long enough leash, maybe you can develop it right. eventually or at least look comp comp competent, right? Like that, right. that's all you're going to be looking for. He's gonna be known as one of the biggest busts ever, but he was gone after one year, which is right. Which is Crazy. I mean, I think they had to because they knew he wasn't it. You know what right. I'm saying? And they brought in Cliff Kingsbury and they had the first overall pick and Kyler Murray fit what Cliff Kingsbury does well. Yeah. You want to get that well, uh, very, very well. So um, I think that also needs to be weighed in. Yeah, that's a factor as well. But, but both those guys, Wilson and Rosen and all these other busts like them, I just don't think they had the it factor. And Jones has the it factor. And that's something that maybe I wasn't high enough on. I don't know. I still think a lot of this, though, does come down to the coaching. Like, when these guys are in good coaching fits, they look a lot better. And when they're in bad coaching fits, they look a lot worse. Um, but there are, like, there are issues in, you know, these quarterbacks game that I can put more time into. Like, for Wilson, like I was saying, Zach Wilson, it was I wasn't factoring in the drop-off from that BYU offensive line versus the, the level of defensive lines they played versus what it's going to look like when you get to the NFL and they're pressuring you more. And putting way too much, I was putting way too much weight on his arm talent which is not, you know, it's not like you can have all the arm talent in the world, but you need all these other things too. And with Jones, I probably wasn't putting enough, you know, factor on how bad the coaching was with J with Jason Garrett. And it really was. So there are a lot of things to learn. I, as, as I've always said with quarterbacks, I'm going to get a lot more wrong than I get right. Just like the NFL, right? The NFL gets so much more wrong at the quarterback position than they get right. So as analysts, you should be, you should be happy to get like 20% of these, right? And so I just think that's going to be how it is. And I'll try to learn. I'll try to factor in all the different things. Um, but ultimately, you just have to keep going and, and keep adjusting and changing your patterns. Yeah, Daniel Jones has the the baseline in spades, right? Like he's yeah, always he doing yep. the right thing. Like that's not even to be questioned. But now we got a question on Daniel Jones from okay. Tree. He asks, if the Texans offered their first round pick, presuming it's the first or second pick overall for Daniel Jones and only Daniel Jones, do you take that deal if you're the Giants? That's an interesting question as well. These are back-to-back -back interesting questions on the quarterback position. Always seem to get those. So I'll say this. If I had that first overall pick from the Texans, I think they will get the first overall pick. I would take Bryce Young. I think when it comes to the, the situation we're going to have, there's going to be a ton of discussion over these next three months about the quarterbacks, Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, and Will Levis and Anthony Richardson. And I know C.J. Stroud just had like the best game he's ever had on film in his collegiate career yeah. in the most important moment. But I feel like, and then everyone says, oh, Bryce Young is so small, this and that. I feel like the Bryce Young narrative leading up to the draft and from this point on is going to be so similar to what happened with Deshaun Watson going into his draft class. A lot of people watch Deshaun Watson absolutely dominate college football, 
literally beat Saban defense twice. He had everything on film. He dominated. He looked great. But then everyone's like, is he too small? Does he have enough arm talent, right? Those were the same questions to Sean Watson, and he dropped all the way to, what, 12 in the draft? And ultimately, he was the best quarterback in college football, and he was the best quarterback in that. Well, he wasn't the best quarterback class. That class had Mahomes, too. But he was the set. He was the best quarterback in, like, any other class he would be. And I think Bryce Young is going to fit a similar mold to the Deshaun Watson thing, so I would go Young. Now, this question is, then it becomes between who would you rather have, Young or Jones, but it's that's not the only part of the question. That's the difficult part. Like, I think a case could be made that Daniel Jones might be a better quarterback than Bryce Young. I'm not saying I would make that case. I don't know. But Daniel Jones has better size. He has equal speed, I would say. Um, you know, he arm talent, somewhat comparable, I would think, between those two. I think that's pretty similar. I don't. I think Bryce Young has too much better of an arm. And he has more experience in the league. But the problem is, with this whole question tree, it's impossible for me to not take this trade because if I take this trade, I get Bryce Young under contract for five years. And four of those years are under a rookie contract, right? And then the fifth year is a team option that's pretty cheap too. If I don't take the trade, I re-sign Jones for 35, 36, 37 million against the cap every year. So how can I not take that take that swing knowing I get the cap savings? Not to mention you just have that pick now, right? So even if you didn't want Bryce, you can go through the entire scouting process, take whoever you want. You could take a developmental guy. You could trade back. There's a lot of options that you can do. Like I'm taking the pick over Daniel Jones, basically for the contractual reasons that you brought up. And that's, I don't think a slight on Daniel Jones. You talk about the first overall pick yeah. in the freaking draft, like put that stuff into perspective right there. Right. But I still love Daniel Jones at the same time. Right. Brandon Marcus asks, you alluded to this in a reply earlier, but with all the money expected to go towards resigning players, what's the over under for free agent starters, significant snap players signed this off season? 1.5 question mark. Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, I am, you know, at odds with some people on giant Twitter who feel like we're just going to go on some kind of spreading spree this off season. I don't know where they're coming up with the, the future cap space. People are like, Oh, look at the cap calculator. You can see all this stuff. Yada, yada. I'm like, okay, but the cap is fluid, right? They know they have to re-sign Thomas at some point. They know they have to re-sign Dex at some point. And it's trending toward them having to reset the market at offensive tackle with Thomas. Reset the market and tier defensive line with Lawrence. Those are going to be insane contracts. Then you also are giving 35 to 36 AAV to Daniel Jones, probably 15 to 17 AAV to Saquon Barkley, maybe a Julian Love contract as well. McKinney's coming soon. Like, there isn't really money to be had for free agents. So I would take the under 1.5 for significant guys. I think it's going to look similar to this past off season with the one swing on Glowinski, but that swing will be a little bit bigger. It might be Tremaine Edmonds. We'll see what that costs. One bigger swing and then same thing as last time. So under one and a half because one big swing and then same thing as this time. They're going to get their Hodgins. They're going to look for their Hodgins types. They're Jalen Smith throughout the year and different guys like that. They can grind out the back end, but I'll take the under on, on more than one and a half significant big swings. Yeah, I'm right there with you. And I think you make an excellent point with Dexter Lawrence, with Andrew Thomas, and then with Xavier McKinney. This is going to be, you know, a 30,000 foot view type of question that we're going to be discussing over the next like yes. two years, right? Paying these players that were drafted by Dave Gettleman, who happened to be hits and who are, I think, going to be core pieces to the Joe Shane, Brian Dable Giants moving forward. Yep. Christopher Stefan asks, give the most favorable order of teams the Giants could face in the playoffs. So we did this one on the first one, but just to recap, in case you didn't listen to that one, Vikings, uh, what I do? Vikings, Bucks, Packers at home. Yeah, yeah, that's, that would that's, be that's, the, that's the best scenario. Vikings round one, Bucks round two, Packers at home in the NFC Championship game. Yep. The humble one asks, would you guys be against using a second or third pick on another edge rusher in this draft? Truly believe we have one of the best defensive line situations in the league going forward. Why not continue to add to it like teams like such as Washington did? And I'm not opposed to that personally, depending again on the value of the player and the talent of the player. Don't need to reach anything, but if there's somebody there you have a high grade on, in the second or third round, I'm not opposed to investing another pick on edge, especially with the way Wink Martindale wants to rotate these guys. Guy like, dude, a guy like O'Shane Zimenez, take it for him. He's been kind of a, a key player, and he might not be back next year. He's been kind of a key player to the fire zone blitzes that Wink Martindale has right. brought, right? Like, how many times do you see O'Shane out there to the field side sometimes? You know, he acts like he's coming, he holds that tackle in place, and then he bails and sinks underneath or matches the running back into the flat. They're going to have to replace that skill set if they don't bring him back. Now, 
that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a second round pick. Doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a third round pick. And it's something that I feel like Aziz Ojolari or KT could also do, but you still want depth in the edge, especially when you have a player like Aziz Ojolari, who this season has been just ravaged by injuries basically the entire year. Yeah. I think it's a great take by you. I also think even just if you, even like an interior defensive lineman, if they love someone I'd be interested in, I'm like back on, I I'm like moving (laughs) more toward into now that we watch all this film i don't know i don't know what it is dude but i'm like more on interior defensive lineman than i've ever been in, in my life for as far as roster building goes i don't know i just feel like watching some teams on film like the washington for example like what those interior guys can do for that defensive line like it's insane they just control the whole point of attack and you can do so you can do so much less as an offense against those type of teams like you can beat those types of uh, setups with quick game but it's you can't always win with quick game. So I don't know. I, I like that idea. One thing I'm going to say 30,000 foot view to answer your question, the humble one um, shout out one of our longtime listeners. Oh yeah, This is a 30,000 foot view, but I stand by it. It's very important to view the draft as what it is and not what you think it could be or what it, you think it should be, right? The draft is not a situation where you have a hundred picks in a row and each pick is a descending level of, of success. So pick 23 is going to be a little more successful than pick 26. Pick 28 is going to be a little more. And in the same way, it's not it's not stacked that way by position. Cornerback one is not going to be a little bit better than cornerback two. Cornerback two is not going to be a little bit better than cornerback three. So with that in mind, I don't give a crap what position they take as long as it's not like running back in the positions that aren't really good to build around early in the first round, something like that. As long as you're understanding positional value, which Joe Shane last off season before his first draft did a whole interview with John Schmelk and basically confirmed. I consider I'm very interested in positional value with these draft picks. So as long as you're factoring that in, then I don't care who, what position you take because it's way more important to get the pick, right? It's so much more important to get the pick, right? That's what like, there's so many busts in the draft. Look at every draft class you want. Go look at the last three draft class and or let, go back five years and then look at where those guys are now in the NFL. Go by the first hundred picks in the draft. Almost like the vast majority are just busts. They're just not starters right now. Some of them are not in the NFL. So way more important to get the pick right than to get the position right. <laughs> yeah, no, you're hundred percent right. It's something that Dan and I have been bringing up this entire time. And I'm laughing yeah. because I checked the Google doc, the outline, and I see the next question that we have. And the guy who asked it, his name no, is I Simon. I did that on purpose, yeah. <laughs> so Simon says, I love that, Dan. Not so much a question as a theory on the gates Bredesen rotation. Much like the recent flot McLeod rotation, it has less to do with specific players involved and more with getting reps for the next man up. There are three offensive linemen and three cornerbacks whose injuries put Gates and Flott into service. I think that is a very good observation, Simon. And I'll also add, I think the rotation is also because those two players in each circumstance, they're comparable, right? You're not really getting a drop off in play by substituting Ben Bredesen in for Nick Gates or Nick Gates in for Ben Bredesen, similar to Flott and McLeod. And specifically to Flott, he is a rookie who you just drafted, this regime just drafted on day two. You want to get that guy reps. I think if you watch the film, Flott shows some, I would say, intriguing coverage skills, right? I feel like he has done a better job staying in phase and being a little bit more disciplined. But I would ultimately, I think I would say Nick McLeod is somebody who I'm a little bit more interested in in terms of who is up to speed more right now. He's been challenged a little bit more as well, and he's risen to the occasion. But if you want to rotate those two, I'm not opposed to it because I don't see a significant drop off. Yeah. You nailed it, Nick. And I, more importantly, Simon, this is a great observation. I think this is definitely in play, this theory, because it makes sense. Like you have one injury. Now you have a much better chance of, of, of replacing that injured player. So I like this a lot. Jaden Bailey asked a hypothetical. If you needed a head coach, would you trade a one, two, and a first, second, and third round pick for Sean Payton? It's I don't think a similar so. value to previous coach trades. Yeah, I don't think I would. I think it would depend on my situation. Like if I'm a really good team for whatever reason, who just has a crappy coach, maybe I'd consider it, but... I just, I, I wouldn't want to do that. I'm completely out on trading draft picks for coaches. Personally, I have no interest in that. I'll never have interest in that. I, to me, most of this is the players. Now this year is an interesting example because the coaching has played such a big role in the giants success this year. That's kind of throwing that off to some extent, but still it's about the players. Like you're giving up your first, second and third round pick to get a head coach. Well, guess what? You could have also just hired Brian Dable. Or hired Mike McDaniel and a lot of these other guys that are like doing a good job that aren't as highly acclaimed going into their first job. So, no, I would never do it personally. 
Next question is from Jake the Giant Four. Ben Bredesen, worth the trade in hindsight? I think it was, right? Like it wasn't that much given up in that trade. I just I just pulled it up. The Giants received Bredesen along with a fifth in 2022 and a 2023 seventh round pick in exchange for a 2022 fourth round pick. To me, that's easily a hit. I would agree. It was a good trade in hindsight. Giants Passion asks, Buffalo or barbecue wings? Play guys or rest guys? Jones or Barkley? Back or forth? Zeppelin or dead? Shaw or <clears throat> Shawshank or Forrest Gump? 1994 films. Let's do rapid fire here, Dan. Okay? okay. Let's do rapid fire. So ready? We'll go first. Buffalo or barbecue wings? Go. Buffalo. Barbecue. Okay. okay. Play guys or rest guys? Go. Rest. Play guys, but not all of them. It's a little bit more nuanced than that. Jones or Barkley or both or both. Okay. Go both Jones. So that depends, I guess, on what exactly we're talking about. What do we think is going to happen? Or what oh, no, we- I think they're both coming back. This is, I think this is what we would do, right? Okay. So what we would do, it depends on the contract for Barkley. Like I'm open to bringing Barkley back, but it would depend on the contract. But realistically, I think I would probably just go with Jones as well. Zeppelin or dead, dead. Uh, you? still Zeppelin for me. I'm, I've been getting big into the dead lately, but it's always going to be Zeppelin for me uh, uh, over dead. I knew you would struggle with that one. It's Shawshank or Forrest Gump. That's a that's really good a freaking one. tough one. I know. Those are both phenomenal films. Both 1994. He said, uh, it's so tough. Uh, I'm going to go to Gump though. Gump is, I, I watch, I've seen Gump way more times. I think I'm going to go with Gump as well, but that is, so I think Shawshank tough. is actually the better movie, but I will, I want to see Gump more often than I watch Shawshank. Matt Matthew Traum asked, people are talking about building momentum if we play the Eagles well in this meaningless game. But would you be worried about the opposite if an unmotivated Giants team gets smacked around by an Eagles team, giving it their all? I kind of feel like if you can't give it your all, why bother? I don't think that's a bad take. I don't. And I think that's kind of the conundrum that this coaching staff is in right now. And it's kind of that would suck, man, if the Giants went into that game and just got absolutely embarrassed. And it's really a yeah. lot of struggles With for their starters, you're saying. Giants. Yeah. And like, I kind of think the Giants might dress their starters, but I think they're going to pull them eventually. So that kind really? of is, yeah, I think they might give them like a drive or two for right. whatever reason, and then they'll pull them. And then Tyrod okay. Taylor will play most of the game. That's kind of what I ultimately think is going to happen. Me too. That's what I would guess would happen. And as far as answering your question, I'll say one thing 30,000 foot view wise. I believe in momentum to an extent, but for me, it's to an extent. I don't know how much tangible evidence supports momentum. I still believe in it because I've experienced it and I've felt it in my own sports that I've played, in watching the Giants through the years. But I think a lot of it is just matchups. Like, I don't think playing hard against the Eagles is going to change the matchup against the Vikings, personally. I think losing a player due to injury in this game against the Eagles could definitely change the matchup against the Vikings. And that's basically where I'm at. Yeah, I think you're right. And the Giants have momentum right now. And I guess that would be the argument for it, right? Like keep riding that momentum. Keep riding the momentum. Brings up a brings up a really good point. Like what if it's the same result as what we saw a couple of weeks ago? Like that momentum is going to crash. All right. So we have a question here. Do you guys see a wide receiver that the Giants may target to acquire other than the draft? Look, we've kind of talked about that quite a bit. Yep. Maybe someone on the history with Dable and Shane. But here's the second part of his question. What is the better all-time show? Breaking Bad or The Sopranos? I have Breaking Bad slightly higher. I once did my, uh, I put out a tweet. Give me any TV show and I'll give it a one to 10 grade with decimals. And I think that The Wire, obviously, for me is 10.0. Um, what's that what's that show can you describe it to me the why is the greatest show of all time but i think i had sopranos at a nine six and a breaking bad at a nine seven and breaking bad is probably second third in the in the third two through five range of all time for me sopranos is in that same range but a little bit lower so i would go breaking bad over sopranos slightly i, I kind of am there too but there's a part of me that says nah dude you have to go with sopranos just stop yeah. you know just and I've seen- had a little bit of lulls though. Like the first half of the final season wasn't great. I didn't think the fifth season was that amazing. Three and four are amazing. One and two are the best. Breaking Bad though has its lulls too. It starts a little slow. I was gonna say it starts really slow. Yeah. yeah. But at its peak, I still think Breaking Bad is best. Yeah, I think I'm there with you. Unfortunately, because yeah. I want to go with Sopranos, but I've only seen Breaking Bad one time. I saw I've seen Sopranos like three times. Okay. Okay, we're not yet. Yeah, this question is dumb. We're not gonna read that. Uh, so, so Mark Breyer asks, "How would you rate the overall job Mike Kafka has done this season as a first 
year play caller, things he did well, things to improve for next year. Yeah, I mean, look, you came to the right place if you like Mike Kafka, because this is a podcast that does. I think Mike Kafka has done a phenomenal job this year, as good as it could possibly be for a first year play caller. I think things he's done well, specifically red zone offense, red zone play design. Other things he's done well, show plays that look exactly the same and then do something completely different off them. Another thing he's done well, situational play calling. There's been so many situational play calls I can count on more than one hand where I'm just like, damn, that was that was what I wanted. That caught the defense off guard. And a lot of what Nick said and Nick and I have said throughout the last you know few months, he's a tendency breaker. He'll find tendencies that these defensive coordinators have and he'll break them with his play calls. So as far as things to improve, I think he can throw a little bit more on second and long. I think he can throw a little bit more on first down, but he's starting to do those things now. So it's hard to say improve because now he's showing he is doing those things and he's finally trusting his offense to do those things. And I don't know if they'll turn back. So other than that, I don't have too much. Not to crap on the previous offensive coordinator, yeah. but Jason Garrett had his system, right? And that was his system. Mike Kafka, he has a system, but he tailors his system to his players right. and to his opponent, and he naturally evolves. We saw two years of Jason Garrett where there was not that much evolution. It's not like that with Mike Kafka. I love the fluidity of this play caller, and this is his first time calling plays. So I think I think the trajectory is going to continue to ascend. And I really I think I just hope he is the offensive coordinator next year. I, I really do, because I think um really highly of Mike Kafka right now. Okay, let's go to MYG Mason who says Phil Sims or Eli Manning, who was better? Again, you're asking two millennials, and we're both yeah. going to say Eli Manning. We're both going to say Eli here. Bigfoot lined up against Andrew Thomas for 60 minutes. How many pressure sacks and hits does he get on Daniel Jones, realistically? Absolutely zero, because DJ <laughs> would have Bigfoot all the time. Bigfoot doesn't want to be seen, so he would never show yeah. up to the game to begin with. And Andrew Thomas is an absolute stud. Yeah. How about... um? Giant Roddy Piper says, if the players rested to avoid injury and therefore we made it less likely we win this Eagles game... Isn't it the same as when Peterson rested his players two years ago and not playing to win? Sounds a lot like the same fans wanting players rested that were mad at the Eagles not playing to win. Yeah, I think there's definitely a correlation between those between those two things. I think the the difference would be that Doug Peterson sat his rookie quarterback, who he is still evaluating in his rookie season, who did not start the entire year in what I think the entire second half in favor for um, numb nuts. What was his name again? Nate Sudfeld. Or Sudfeld. Yeah, yeah, Nate Sudfeld. And the Giants might be going into this situation with a locked up playoff spot where the Eagles were already bounced. And the Giants right. like, we have nothing to gain here. We're just trying to preserve our players, have them healthy for the playoffs. I think that's kind of a big difference, but I get where you're going right with your point. Yeah, I would agree. Next question from Unnamed says, how would, or we just didn't get the name, says, how's, how's Roger Anderson looking on tape? <laughs> unnamed that's awesome how's Ryder anderson looking at? look he looks fine out there like he's in one of the sub packages with justin ellis he's a big body like 290 pound defensive lineman he's not doing a ton in terms of getting pressures and, and winning the pass rushing reps but he's holding up at the point of attack he's not really getting bitched around too much look him and henry mondu are, are fine rotational defensive linemen i think feel like they both struggle with absorbing double teams which is something that a lot of interior defensive linemen struggle with it's not easy to take on two guys who weigh like 310 pounds were trying to remove you from the line of scrimmage. But overall, I would say it's been a, a solid rookie season from him. Like remember RJ three from last year. Yeah. Yeah. Like I feel like Ryder Anderson is a better version of that guy yeah. maybe a little bit bigger and you could use him more inside as like a three technique, a four I rather than an edge, even though RJ three was, was that too. Yeah. How about this next question? It comes from uh, Schwab to cycler. He says, is Matt paired on the Giants in 2023? I think that's interesting, and I hope so, right? Like, I like Matt Parrott, but I think we all expected that the Giants might have landed two tackles in that 2020 draft. Like, man, they might have stole somebody. Yeah. He has all these traits. It, it, that, he's not that. Like, I've seen enough Matt Parrott to say, I don't think he's going to be right. a successful starter here in New York. But as a rotational guy who can come in and be your sixth offensive lineman, who can spot start for you, I think he's fine. So I would like to see him here in 2023. Cheap contract, right? Like, yeah, I don't have any issue with that, but it's not something I'm going to lose sleep over if the Giants decide to part ways with them either. I completely agree with Nick. The contract's so cheap. He's a third round pick, so he's not making much against the cap that I would want him there for the upside of that. But I, I won't 
I won't lose sleep over it either. Okay, Rob Allen says, I request if you guys see fit. I only have four followers, so no one will listen to me. So could you tell Giants Nation to move on from the whole Kenny Galladay has never caught a touchdown with the Giants stuff? We found Hodgins. We were in the playoffs. Let's move on. Yeah, look, I feel you. But that's a $72 million contract, and it's seared into the hearts of the New York Giant fans. Like We've taken that L on Kenny Galladay. I think every Giant fan has admitted that. But I think a lot of Giant fans are going to remain bitter when there's a guy who's taking up that much of your cap and who is not seeing the football field. I'm right there with you. Look, the Giants are a totally different team. That is a mistake from a previous regime. Right. It's just this current regime now needs to still live with that mistake. And the fact that we get to see 19 trot out there four to five to six times a game, it's just like, oh my God, man, like what a disaster. Somewhat of a remembrance of just how bad things actually were during the previous regime. Whereas now the light is much brighter, but I, I think I'm there. Like we don't need to pile on, I guess is, is where I think you're going. And I, I guess I'm there with you as well. Like there's no reason to pile on to Kenny Galladay at this point. I don't even think it's his fault. I just don't think he can play football anymore. Yeah, I would agree with Nick. I don't really love the piling on. I see on giants Twitter about Kenny Galladay, like just leave it alone at this point. There's nothing to gain from it in my mind. So it sucks. The situation is not great, but there's nothing that can be gained from piling on against him. So Matt Dubois asks, give me your guys' favorite Marvel superhero and your favorite Marvel movie. Okay. So I think it was right after the draft during a mailbag show. I brought up, I was like, I've never seen a Marvel movie. I've never seen Star Wars. I've never seen Harry Potter. I still never seen Star Wars. I still never seen Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. But since then, I went on a huge Marvel kick and I've watched every single Marvel movie with my girl up until Endgame. I haven't watched that you yet. You saw so, Infinity War though? The first one, I guess. Uh, yeah, no, no. I, Infinity War is just before Endgame. I think so. Yeah. Like I've, I've seen the one, I don't want to say it, but like I've seen the one where a lot of crazy stuff happens and you're like, what the? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, I've Infinity seen War. that. Yes. So I'm up to that point. I'm waiting to Amazing watch movie. Endgame. Yes. And that would probably be my, my one, but I want to kind of go to a more niche one a little bit. And okay. I'm going to go with civil war. I really like civil war. I thought Ragnarok was good. I liked all the iron man. I, li I like really all the movies. I even like like Ant-Man a lot. I thought that was a really cool. Yeah. Premise, right. So, um, but I like civil war and I, I felt like iron man was my favorite character, Dan, for quite a while. But then, uh, when civil war happened, I gravitated so much more towards captain America. So I was like, kind of battling between those two being, I guess, my favorite. I like Thor a lot. I kind of like them all. I Low-key, this isn't really a popular take. Not a big Hulk guy. I feel like Hulk is the biggest liability out there. Everyone loves Hulk. I'm like, why? You piss him off, and he just goes off, and he destroys literally everything, and no one can control this guy, except for, <laughs> um, what's her name? Uh, the one actress who kind of kind of can get him to calm down. So I just like, I feel like he's wildly overrated. He's just a complete and utter wild card. <laughs> but if I had to choose my favorite, I think at this point, I'm going to lean towards Chris Evans and uh, Captain America. Nice. I like all the Marvel you? takes. I was similar to you. I had never seen any of the Marvel movies in that phase, the last phase they had, which ends in Endgame, um, starts with Iron Man, I believe. And then I binged them all. So like over the last two or three years, and I've seen them all. So I love great. them too. I find them great. They're just, once you start going to, you know, parallel universe type stuff time travel all those different things those concepts space concepts then i'm in so my favorite superhero is thor i've always loved thor the most but my surprise too after thor would actually be star lord so i just love the guardians of the galaxy so my favorite movies i mean i think endgame and infinity war are just perfect 10 of 10 movies like every single scene nothing wasted but my actual favorite from enjoyment standpoint, so it's those, those are the best, but my favorite from enjoyment standpoint was always Ragnarok. I think Ragnarok did the perfect job of, of mixing a Marvel superhero movie with the comedy. The comedy in that movie is phenomenal. Yeah, it's and great. it's Taika Waititi who wrote it and Taika Waititi directed and wrote it. He's the man. If you guys haven't seen it, Reservation Dogs on Hulu, it's one of his newest shows. Phenomenal television i also think what we do in the shadows is great another one of his shows uh there's supposedly there's one on hbo i haven't seen what something with the sales but it's like a pirate one it's supposedly supposedly funny as hell too so taiko atiti did ragnarok and he dominated so ragnarok would be like my outside pick um if i didn't get to choose infinity war and endgame um and yeah i think civil war is great i love that one too i love the guardians movies though those are up there for me as well yeah, they're great. Quill is a great character. And also, we've never discussed this before, but I also have a, uh, a a character, a bad guy, who was like my favorite character, and it was Loki. I was a big oh, Loki. Oh, Loki's great. Dude, you got to see oh, his TV yeah. show. The Loki show is amazing. Really? I didn't even know there was one. So Yeah, check it out.
Okay, no, I will because yeah. like he's the picture when I when I go onto that app when I go onto Disney Plus, it's yeah. Loki picture. Like he was like probably my I don't want to say he was my favorite because oh, it was going to be. If you're Avengers. using Disney Plus to watch these movies, you can watch all the Marvel shows too. Oh, I will. The I best one is Loki by far. So check that one out. Yeah, he's badass. I I like him. All right, we'll wrap up there. It's the end of Mailbag Part Two. Thank you to everybody tuning in, listening to Big Blue Bander Podcast, supporting us along the way. Have a great rest of your week. Go Giants! Playoffs is coming soon, baby. <laughs>